king. I went to the middle of the room and called out, I know you're here, and noticed him in the corner, looking tiny in his jeweled crown and his cape with ermine trim. I have lost my desire to rule, he said. My kingdom is empty except for you, and all you do is ask for me. But your majesty, don't your majesty me, he said, and tilted his head to one side and closed his eyes. There, he whispered, that's more like it. And he entered his dream like a mouse vanishing into its hole. I had been a polar explorer. I had been a polar explorer in my youth and spent countless days and nights freezing in one blank place and then another. Eventually, I quit my travels and stayed at home and there grew within me a sudden excess of desire as if a brilliant stream of light of the sort one sees within a diamond were passing through me. I filled page after page with visions of what I had witnessed. Groaning seas of pack ice, giant glaciers, and the wind swept white of icebergs. Then, with nothing more to say, I stopped and turned my sights on what was near. Almost at once, a man wearing a dark coat and broad-brimmed hat appeared under the trees in front of my house. The way he stared straight ahead and stood, not shifting his weight, letting his arms hang down at his side, made me think that I knew him. But when I raised my hand to say hello, he took a step back, turned away, and started to fade, as long he fades until nothing is left of it. Two Horses, the famous poem by James Wright called Two Horses. This is a much less famous poem. <laughs> <laughs> On a warm night in June, I went to the lake, got on all fours and drank like an animal. Two horses came up beside me to drink as well. This is amazing, I thought, but who will believe it? The horses eyed me from time to time, snorting and nodding. I felt the need to respond. So I snorted too, <laughs> but haltingly, as though not really wanting to be heard. The horses must have sensed that I was holding back. <laughs> they moved slightly away. <laughs> then I thought they might have known me in another life, the one in which I was a poet. <laughs> They might have even read my poem. <laughs> For back then, in that shadowy time when our eagerness knew no bounds, we changed styles almost as often as there were days in the year. 2002. I'm not thinking of death, but death is thinking of me. He leans back in his chair rubs his hands, strokes his beard and says, I'm thinking of Strand. <laughs> thinking that one of these days I'll be out back swinging my scythe or holding my hourglass up to the moon and Strand will appear in a jacket and tie together under the boulevard's leafless trees we'll stroll into the city of souls and when we get to the great piazza with its marble mansions the crowd that had been waiting there will welcome us with delirious cries 
and their tears turned hard and cold as glass from having been held back so long will fall and clatter on the stones below. Oh, let it be soon. Let it be soon. Man and Camel On the eve of my 40th birthday, I sat on the porch having a smoke when out of the blue a man and a camel happened by. Neither uttered a sound at first, but as they drifted up the street and out of town, the two of them began to sing. Yet what they sang is still a mystery to me. The words were indistinct, and the tune too ornamental to recall. Into the desert they went, and as they went, their voices rose as one above the sifting sound of wind-blown sand. The wonder of their singing, its elusive blend of man and camel, seemed an ideal image for all uncommon couples. Was this the night that I had waited for so long? I wanted to believe it was, but just as they were vanishing, the man and camel ceased to sing and galloped back to town. They stood before my porch, staring up at me with beady eyes and said, You ruined it. You ruined it forever. <laughs> uh, that incidentally is the title of the forthcoming book. You can buy it. It's not here, but I'll take the money. <laughs> Error. We drifted downstream under a scattering of stars and slept until the sun rose. When we got to the capital, which lay in ruins, we built a large fire out of what chairs and tables we could find. The heat was so fierce that birds overhead caught fire and fell flaming to earth. These we ate then continued on foot into regions where the sea is frozen and the ground is strewn with moonlight boulders. If only we had stopped, turned, and gone back to the garden we started from, with its broken urn, its pile of rotting leaves, and gazing up at the house, and seen only the passing of sunlight over its windows, that would have been enough, even if the wind cried and clouds scudded seaward like the pages of the book on which nothing was written. <laughs> the poems are the story. I'm the poem. <laughs> Conversation. One. He said it would always be what might have been. A city about to happen. A city never completed. One that disappeared with hardly a trace. Inside or beneath the outer city. Making the outer one, the one in which we spend our waking hours, seem pointless and dull. It would always be a city in the dark. A city so shy that it waited, dreading the moment that was never to be. <coughs> Two. I said that the dawning of the unknown was always before us, and that the realization of anything is a constant threat. I also said that there is sadness in knowing that the undoing of what has been done will never take place that the history of now is as distant as the future of when. Our skills are limited, our power to imagine enfeebled, our cities doomed, all roads lead to the malodorous sea. Elevator. 
two parts. One, the elevator went to the basement. The doors opened. A man stepped in and asked if I was going up. I'm going down, I said. I won't be going up. Two, the elevator went to the basement. The doors opened. A man stepped in and asked if I was going up. I'm going down, I said. I won't be going up. Mirror. Get this tune coming in. <laughs> Makes me want to dance. <laughs> a white room and a party going on. And I was standing with some friends under a large gilt framed mirror that tilted slightly forward over the fireplace. We were drinking whiskey and some of us feeling no pain were trying to decide what precise shade of yellow the setting sun turned our drinks. I closed my eyes briefly, then looked up into the mirror. A woman in a green dress leaned against the far wall. She seemed distracted, fingers of one hand fidgeted with her necklace, and she was staring into the mirror, not at me, but passed me into a space that might be filled by someone yet to arrive, who at that moment could be starting the journey which would lead eventually to her. And suddenly my friends said it was time to move on. This was years ago. And though I have forgotten where we went and who we all were, I still recall that moment of looking up and seeing the woman stare past me into a place I could only imagine. And each time it is with a pang, as if just then I was stepping from the depths of the mirror into that white room, breathless and eager, only to discover too late that she is not there. Moon. Open the book of evening to the page where the moon, always the moon, appears between two clouds, moving so slowly that hours will seem to have passed before you reach the next page, where the moon, now brighter, lowers a path to lead you away from what you have known into those places where what you had wished for happens. It's lone syllable like a sentence poised at the edge of sense, waiting for you to say its name once more as you lift your eyes from the page and close the book, still feeling what it was like to dwell in that light, that sudden paradise of sound. My mother uh, and I did many wonderful things together. We had a lot, she was a lot of fun to be with. And uh, she took me to the Statue of Liberty sometimes. And somehow, because she was very anxious for me to uh, be educated and to uh, express myself and whatever I was, uh, she knew I was a poet and she was a poet too, but she never had a chance to become a poet. She served her family. Uh, but this introductory image of my mother, it is, I, I think I confabulated her with a Statue of Liberty. There, by the rail, 
my mother at 17. Pale, her thin white arm raised as in salute to a seagull trailing the ship Homeric, September 1922. Black dress flutters behind her, a silken whispering about her knees, covered with black hose above black shoes, mourning the year-hardened mystery of her father, who disappeared en route to a Turkish town. My mother came from a large family. My grandmother brought a whole brood of children here. and There was lots of cooking and washing and chores. And uh, when I was little, my mother used to take me to my grandmother, and we'd sit in my grandmother's kitchen. And that was a great adventure for me. It is warm in grandma's kitchen. Throughout this, her second apartment in the new world, the fiery steam heat rises with dawn and dinner from the coal-stoked furnace in the basement. But the kitchen is warmed all day by the cooking and washing. My mother, my grandmother, sit at the white enamel kitchen table, kneading dough, shelling peas, measuring pine nuts into the chopped lamb and onions, soaking the crushed wheat for kibbe, filling dozens of meat pies, stuffing chicken and squash and green peppers and eggplant, rolling stuffed grape leaves and stuffed cabbage like cigars, making dumplings for yogurt soup among cans of sesame oil and boiled butter, peeling scores of potatoes for baked lamb necks and shanks and roast chicken, boiling rice, browning rice and onions, adding rice and tomatoes to large pots of marabone vegetable soup, sitting and chatting over familiar tasks that are done, must be done every day, without respite, my mother, my grandmother at the kitchen table, with me between them on a stool in the corner, where I watch and listen, tasting dough and stuffing, rewards for being content to observe and accept with my silence their love. Waiting for them to acknowledge me, I absorb the strange names of relatives and friends I shall never meet. Bet this and bet that. Houses remote as the house of Atrus. Incidents and characters recalled and savored as I anticipate the mention of meaningful names dropping from the flow of Arabic between them. Aunts and uncles who live in the house, my mother's sisters and brothers. And I bear witness to a daily translation of two women's lives into pots and pans, the circumscription of kitchen walls with heat rising among the smells and rhythm of effort into patterns and patience, interchangeable days carried by movements worn to such precision that hand and object extend each other. How many times does the body yearn beyond clothesline and tar roof? Dough sticks to fingers, clock hands restrain. Here's the way I felt about my grandmother when I was a child, even though I loved her, but uh, she did take a lot of my mother's time, and I was an only child, too. In the long parlor mirror, my grandmother sits watching me roll back the door, holds a smile to show as I enter, seeking my mother. She is hiding her under her skirt, behind her gold teeth. She has wound her as beads round the neck, jet beads for mourning. She has wound her on top of her head in a knot, pinned her with jagged hairpins. Oh, mother, I'll pick you right out of her eyes, off her skin that is thick with you. I'll give you a room with a nice view of life and a pen and some ink and paper in sheaves. My mother, my poetry, you. We used to uh, go to the library every week. And that was fun. Book laden on Friday, we board the Franklin Avenue trolley. That dates me right. <laughs> and pass under elevated tracks to the library. Inside, I sit 
on a child's chair that dips into forests and fly with griffins and gods into the mystic certitude of words. My mother, pensive, content, reads in the next room where her presence beckons mysterious volumes. Half filling a chair beside her, we study Dante's Inferno, I mainly, Doré. Along the aisle, my mother, at your skirt I feel your cool fingers, our free hands clutching their books. A reminiscence of my uh, mother who used to pull me in a rosebud type sled. I trust everybody remembers that you maybe not remember from a rerun of Citizen Kane. How many snows have gone down to the yard from my window? White days in darkness. The yard has its own dusk constantly fallen. One tree set on a second floor terrace. I am looking for the sled with backrest. You run ahead, pulling me faster. We gleam past hedges, your small feet in you snow like a surface of clouds, hard to pull through. Yet we go up this chariot of myths in cold air, endlessly lifting. Um. She wanted me to develop myself and uh, sing my own songs. I had many songs and I sang them in the morning of my doorway, giving me over to the visible world in my throat, in my fingers, becoming my cadences profoundly, that I might find a crescent self curved to the tips like arms of the deliberate moon. When she got sick, and she wasn't sick very long, that she died at 63, I consider that very young now. Um, and one, when you see someone you really care about, uh, suffering and and dying uh, you kind of regress and uh, you sort of become a child and this expresses how I felt looking at her the needles in you mommy are not nice they've stuck you all with pins but why having been a good girl your face is littler now than mine. I'm all grown up. You're getting small in that white bed. The nurses come with pills and charts. They squeeze the red bag hanging like a plum with stem attached to you. Slow drops come through. Why can't they put the juice in quickly? Make your cheeks pretty again. Your arms firmly giving a hug. And I, uh, not only did I mourn <laughs> incessantly, but I was very angry when she died. You died of goodness. That disease affecting primarily females brought upward to respect their elders padded flat. So she ceased to become someone whose role I tried to emulate. I am the life my mother wanted. I feel her in my womb, that wise child. Hand on her knee remembers textures. Step remembers her direction. Face in my hands longs for her lap. 
even her apron loved me. My mother's complete works are published in this. There are one poem that she wrote coming to in English uh, at Ellis Island. And, uh, but I'm going to read the little fragment uh, that was written on the back of this post, this postcard, this is a postcard, it's framed in my room. And um, it was 1920 and it wasn't translated uh, because I don't read and write Arabic, very sadly. Uh, but it was translated from the Arabic uh, by her sister Olga in May 1975. What a spiritual rest and heavenly comfort the weary find throughout a hard life while leaning on the rock of pure love. Rock of the shore, the sea waves lash at you to drown you and the violent winds storm you while raindrops fall on you. But the incessant waves serve to cleanse you and the violent storms to strengthen you. And the drops that fall on you tend to give you greater dignity and make you shine whiter under the light of the sun. Let me rest my burdened head on you that I may find strength and patience and persevere in the face of hardships. Thank you. Thank you.